This is where I live. This is where I call home. Cheney is located about 30 minutes east of Ottawa on Russell Road. Its main crossroads are Drouin and Indian Creek Roads. We moved here in August 2014 to retire looking for our forever home. We were seeking a simpler lifestyle away from the hustle and bustle of suburbia. What drew us to this area was the amenities of the outdoors, mainly speaking, La Rose Forest and surrounding area. Having nature just behind our house was very appealing. One day I decided to do some exploring nearby along the banks of Bear Creek. To my amazement, I discovered what seemed to be the remains of an old train bridge. To me, it seemed to be a bit out of place in the middle of a forest. When I returned home, I decided to do some research on it and found a website titled capolgems.ca. I learned it was part of an old railway starting in Rockland and ending in Limoges, built in the late 19th century. Having fed my initial curiosity, I had a feeling there was much more to the history of this train bridge. Over the years, I began to formulate many questions about this railway, such as, who built it? What did it look like when it was in service? What happened to it? Was it built for transporting goods or was it also a passenger train? Where did the stone come to construct the abutments? Were there train stations nearby? To answer all these questions, I decided to further investigate. To my surprise, I discovered this railway had a profound impact in this area. I learned many persons, places, and things have a strong connection to this line. Lastly, the more I learned, the more I realized there was even more to discover. Hello. My name is Michael Green. Join me as I take you on a virtual train ride of the Central Counties Railway from above. On this adventure, I will try to answer all the questions and maybe we'll uncover a few surprises along the way. This is where it all began. This is Dumoulin Park on the shores of the Ottawa River in Rockland. These stone foundations are the remains of a once important structure. This was a bustling work environment for locals. William Cameron Edwards, a native of Russell County, entered the family lumber business in 1863. Five years later, the firm of W.C. Edwards and Company was established. The sawmills Edwards built in Rockland contributed substantially to the community's economic development. The main mill was located at the location of Zumalan Park. A smaller Petit Moulin was located about a kilometer west along the bank of the Ottawa River. He employed many French Canadians and built homes for them. During the mill's operational peak, it employed over a thousand persons. With the opening of the Edwards Mill, many people settled in the Rockland area. The Edwards Company opened a general store at the top of Edwards Street. When mill employees needed to get food, clothes, or tools, they mostly depended on the company's general store. Tokens were used for money by employees for their purchases at the W.C. Edwards store. The opening of the sawmill coincided with the founding 
of Rockland, which Edwards named based upon the rocky landscape in the surrounding area. In 1886, realizing how important a railway would improve the shipping of lumber out of his Rockland mills, Edwards requested a railway link to be created connecting Rockland to South India. He was a major financier of this project. Edwards was Rockland's first postmaster, and then he entered politics in 1887. He sat as the federal member for Russell until 1903, when he was appointed to the Senate. He once owned 24 Sussex, official residence of the Prime Minister of Canada. Before we start our virtual train ride on the Central Counties Railway, also known as CCR, we need to provide some initial background to the beginnings of the rail line. Ottawa, other towns, and villages cut timber for export. Eastern Ontario was originally built on the lumber industry. Prior to trains and railways, logs were floated down the Ottawa River to the St. Lawrence River destination Quebec City, where seagoing vessels were waiting to sell them overseas. When railways were established, lumber barons realized transporting pre-cut lumber by rail was much more profitable. As a result, many rail lines were built crisscrossing eastern Ontario. As a matter of fact, there were three branches of the CCR in eastern Ontario. They all traveled north-south. One was in the Pembroke area, which is not on this map. The other was in Hawkesbury, and lastly, there was the Rotten Branch. They all intersected the Canada Atlantic Railway, also known as the CAR. The CAR went west to the shores of Lake Huron and east crossing the St. Lawrence River, heading to the northern tip of Lake Champlain. This provided an east-west corridor for the shipment of grain from the west and lumber in both directions. We will talk more about CAR a bit later. Auckland was at the northern terminus of the CCR. It also had business-related lines, also called spurs, running through the town. One of the spurs started at the main mill and followed the shore of the Ottawa River where it met up with a smaller Petit Boulet. The spur then started heading south at the western part of Rockland and intersected with the Canadian Northern Railway. This intersection was known as the Diamond. At this intersection, a signal house was erected. The Canadian Northern Railway went from Hawkesbury to Ottawa following the path of the current Trans-Canada Highway 17. Passengers could travel round trip from Hawkesbury to Ottawa for only 75 cents. After passing the Diamond, the spur would hook up with the CCR heading south. The official beginning or northern terminus of the CCR starts at St. Jean and Raymond Streets. The train station still exists today as a semi-detached home on St. Jean Street. In July 1895, the CCR line was complete. A year later, the Rockland station was built ready for passengers. Okay, it's time to depart. All aboard! We are now heading south towards Limoges, with a few stops along the way. The railway headed south following St. Jean, but went around the escarpment south of the city to avoid the hilly terrain. We are now heading south, out of town, but before we continue on, we must discuss another spur that connected to the CCR just past the escarpment. This spur served another prominent business in Rockland. 
The Alexander Stewart Quarry was built in the late 1800s and continued operation until 1912. It was a limestone quarry. Stone was transported from the quarry along its spur to the CCR line. Limestone from the quarry was used to build Patois Très Saint Trinité, the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, and the Soulange Canal, part of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Rumor says there was enough stone in the quarry to build the complete Rideau Canal lock system. Stone was transported along with CCR and then to the CAR at Limoges to Kotsu Landing along the St. Lawrence River. Now we are back on the CCR heading south out of Rockland. Next stop, Clarence Creek. Welcome to Clarence Creek. There is something interesting about this section of the railway. Even though the village had a train station, the line never entered the village itself. I found no documentation that explains why the railway did not enter Clarence Creek, so it remains a bit of a mystery. The closest the railway got to the village was it passed just west of Bouvier Road at Vinette Road. This is about two kilometers away from the village. I can only speculate why the track did not enter the village. It may be due to the cost and the changes of elevations just west. Farmers use the railway to transport their hay crops to market. Here is the actual path of the railway, although you cannot see any evidence of a line from above. The map clearly shows that it was there. The train station was located just beside the net road. A bit further down at Gulf Road, you could see where Skidoo trails used the former track line. Now we are on our way to Hammond. Welcome to Hammond, formerly known as North Indian and not to be confused with South Indian. Hammond was founded at the end of the 19th century when Loyalist descendants from the St. Lawrence River Valley settled just east of the village. The rail line brought workers to Hammond and facilitated the transport of lumber and agricultural products to markets east and west. Hammond had two train stations. The Grand Trunk Station was located in the general location of the current day J. Lalone Rona. The other station was located at the crossing of the Canadian Pacific Line at Jean Drain Road. On June 15, 1914, a fire started in the Grand Trunk freight shed. This evidently occurred from a spark from a passing train. As a result, seven buildings were destroyed by fire. We are now approaching the Canadian Pacific train in Hammond. The Canadian Pacific Line today is used as a walking and cycling trail from Ottawa and ending in the vicinity of Rigo, Quebec. Traveling down this trail, you will soon approach Bourget, where the train station still exists today.
We are now leaving Hammond, making our way to Cheney. You could see the Cheney water tower in the distance about three kilometers away. Next stop, Cheney. We are now on our approach to Cheney. Observant viewers may have seen references to the Central Counties Railway as the Grand Trunk Railway. By the time the Central Counties Railway was opened, it was already under lease by the Canada Atlantic Railway. In 1904, the Grand Trunk Railway, also known as the GTR, purchased the Canada Atlantic Railway. The name remained as such until almost its decommissioning. For this reason, locals remember it as part of the Grand Trunk Railway. For the duration of this documentary, we will also refer to it as the GTR. Welcome to Cheney. The train station was located between the Water Tower and Russell Road. There is no photograph of the train station, however, records document the building was 12 by 24 feet with 10 foot ceilings. The current day Cheney is on Russell Road. The original Cheney was orientated in a north-south direction. In 1892, Samuel T. Cheney bought 200 acres of land. He built a sawmill and gave his name to the small village. The main street was named Rook Street. A blacksmith shop was built along with a cheese factory. Cheney had a cannery where residents were able to can berries that grew locally. In addition to a new post office, there was a general store. By 1897, Cheney consisted of 20 homes. With the operation of the railway, there is a regular hum of business in Cheney. The rail bridge was only in service between 1895 and 1927. In the early 1800s, both Bearbrook and Indian Creeks were more like small rivers. Locals transported timber and cattle on rafts to South Indian, Cheney and Bourget. I could not find any photographs of the bridge when it was in service, but we do know that it was listed as a steel deck truss bridge with a 77 foot span. Based upon the span, the type of abutments, and when the bridge was built, we could assume that the bridge could look like this, or perhaps this. We are now leaving Cheney. One of my initial questions was, where did the stone come to make the train bridge in Cheney? The answer to the question is to Stuart Quarry in Rockland. Each day a train would make at least one round trip from Rockland to Limoges. At the peak of its operation, the line transported 165 train cars of lumber in one week. Even though the GTR Rockland branch was very successful, it did experience fatalities and accidents due to fire. It was also not void of labor disputes and acts of vandalism. Charles Melville Hayes was the president of the Grand Trunk Railway. In 
April 1912, Hayes was in London on business, but was anxious to get back to Canada for the opening of the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. He was traveling back home on the Titanic. Unfortunately, he did not make it for the opening. Hayes helped the women in his party into lifeboats, but remained and perished. His body was recovered and he was buried in Montreal. Welcome to Grant. Grant was settled in the mid 19th century. The village was not an official stop on the GTR line, however, the train did occasionally stop to drop off supplies. The train would pass Grant slowly due to cattle grazing. Many locals could easily jump on and off the train as a result. Grant consisted of a post office, church, school, cheese factory, and a store. The schoolhouse was a small one-classroom building. It taught students from grade one to eight. Over the years, the crop yields began to decline. The forested area began to turn as a sandy desert known as the Bourget Desert. Due to the declining soil conditions and the amount of education the schoolhouse was able to provide, people began to leave Grant. Now we are heading to our final destination, Limoges. We are slowly heading south to Limoges, towards the southern terminus of the GTR. You can see south of Samir Road. There was a double line to assist in coordinating operations. The main reason why W.C. Edwards built the GTR Rockland Branch was to connect to the Canada Atlantic Railway to further distribute his lumber east and west. The Canada Atlantic Railway came to Limoges in 1879, 16 years before the GTR was built. John R. Booth from Ottawa was a lumber tycoon and railroad baron. Booth's sawmill operations in the Ottawa area could never run at full capacity because he required train lines just as Edwards did. He purchased the Montreal and City of Ottawa Junction Railway, the Côte Sioux, and the Province Line Railway Company in 1879, amalgamating them to form the Canada Atlantic Railway. As mentioned before, the line went from Lake Huron to the top of Lake Champlain to access markets east and west. In 1904, the GTR purchased the Canada Atlantic Railway. Eventually, Canadian National Railway, CN, took it over in 1923. Welcome to Limoges, formerly known as South Indian. Limoges was founded in 1872 by a group of French Canadian settlers. The first settlers in Limoges were primarily farmers and the community grew slowly over the years. The community was named after the city of Limoges in France, which was known for its porcelain industry. Because the GTR intersected the CAR, there was only one train station at the intersection. It belonged to the CAR. The intersection was located on the east side of Limoges Road. The train station was located at Hébert and Cambridge Streets. The CN line is in continued use today for via rail service between Ottawa and Montreal. It is also used for the transportation 
of goods and materials. On October 5th, 1897, a tragedy known as the Great Fire struck the region. This tragedy affected Castleman, South Indian, Cheney, and Grant. Forested areas between these villages were decimated. Farmers barely escaped with their lives, and hundreds were left homeless. At South Indian, there were only a few houses left standing. Four bodies were recovered there. The people of Castleman were reported as huddled together on the rocks of the Nation River without sufficient clothing or anything to eat. The South Indian, Cheney and Castleman train stations were destroyed. The CAR lost eight freight cars at South Indian and the train bridge over the Nation River in Castleman was badly damaged. After the fire in Cheney there were discussions that the village would not be rebuilt. Many inhabitants, mostly descendants of the Loyalists, left the region. The village was rebuilt by French-Canadian settlers. After the fire of 1897, Erosion was devastating farmland around Bourget and Cheney. Between the villages of Castleman, Bourget and Limoges, farmers abandoned sandy lands which led to the expansion of the Bourget Desert. Aware of the seriousness of the problem, Ferdinand LaRose suggested that those lands to be reforested to stop the erosion. He was hired by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture to address the problem. In 1928, Mr. LaRose, with help of various governments, bought back the abandoned farmlands and hired local workers to plant trees. In 1928, 6,000 pines were planted and since then, three generations of forest workers have planted trees and maintained the forest. Since the commencement of reforestation in 1928, over 18 million trees have been planted. LaRose Forest is the second largest man-made forest in southern and eastern Ontario. It covers 27,000 acres or 42 square miles. Today it is a premier attraction to the area open to activities such as hiking, cycling and cross-country skiing to name a few. It is a flourishing habitat and is considered a jewel of Prescott Russell. The total distance of the Rockland GTR branch was 17 miles. Although its primary purpose was to transport goods and materials, it also provided a means of transportation for passengers. When required, passenger cars were added to the train. In Rockland, July 29, 1895, a Cumberland football team took a ride on the GTR. Along the way, the number of spectators at train stations began to grow. Upon arriving at South Indian, a band and a large number of citizens were at the station and gave the boys a rousing reception. In the final days of the Rockland GTR, Canadian National took over the railway in 1923. Shortly after, the Rockland Hammond segment of the railway was closed. In 1926, Edwards Wood Mill was closed due to uncertain economic times. This was a driving factor for the end of the line. The last portion to be abandoned was between Clarence Creek and Rockland in 1936. So we are at the end of the line for the Rockland GTR. We look back and ask ourselves, what was the legacy of the railway? How has the GTR impacted the current day city of Clarence Rockland and the nation municipality? 
The answer to this question can be very subjective, depending on who you ask. I'll let the current day footage of Rockland and villages on the railway answer this question. To me, the answer is clear. This train line helped bring growth and prosperity to the region. The result being a Canadian mix of nationalities, religions, and creeds, all living in neighborly friendship. I thank you for taking a ride on the Central Counties Railway or the Rockland Grand Trunk Railway, whatever you want to call it. As mentioned at the beginning, the history of this train line is rich and interconnected. My name is Michael Green. It has been a pleasure to share this piece of local history with you.